Hannah, it's good to see you this morning. I know you've had a time with that shoulder, and we've prayed for you. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Luke chapter 23 with me this morning, please. Luke, the beloved physician, chapter 23, verse number 33. Luke. Even to this day, Luke is a favorite name that uh, people like to, to name their young, their sons. Luke. It's a good name. Luke chapter 23 and verse number 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. My Father, bless his holy book. Lord, use me, Father, this morning as the messenger you've called me to be. Let the unction of the power of the Holy Ghost go forth now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Our Gospels record the crucifixion of Christ. Of all of the horrible things that man's ever thought of to try to inflict upon his fellow man, this is one of the worst. No question about it. It, 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 it showcases the inhumanity of man toward man. Even to this day, things of this nature are happening all over this earth. It is unbelievable at how man can do something to a, his fellow man like this. And crucifixion, of course, has its purposes. But as far as the death of Christ is concerned upon that cross, this is a horrid thing. You use the term the English language. Most don't even really ask what they're saying when they say the crux of the matter is this and so forth and so on. The word crux of the matter simply means the cross, the crucifixion of the matter. In plainer words, the place where it comes together and the issue is settled. So the excruciating pain, excruciating pain, is speaking the pain that comes forth as you would endure it upon a cross, as you would be suffering the horrible, horrible death that comes from the cross. So when I look at this cross, I see something that must stir my soul. First of all, I believe it's real. I believe in the historical account of the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, then you're in sad shape indeed. And of course, I'd like to know what you base that on because the historical record supports the Bible. There's no question about it whatsoever. The first thing I see when I look at this cross is an innocent man. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 8, 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? The Bible sp speaks where God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Time and again, God let them know that he was very pleased with his son. The only one that ever walked this earth, folks, that was sinless. I know some folks think they don't sin, but this man really did not sin. He was perfect in every sense of the word. And so, my friend, I want you to understand something this morning. This is what men do with someone that's innocent. One of the hardest things to accept in life is to see children suffer, especially when it's uh, as it's relate to war, as you can see with uh, what's gone on in the Ukraine, when the monster over there in Russia, whose name is Putin, uh, let loose his uh, dogs and hounds of hell against Ukraine. And it's the innocent little children that get blown to pieces and that starve to death. That's a hard one. That's a hard one to accept in this world. It's easy to accept a man who sowed his seed and understand that he's simply reaping what he sowed. You don't like it, I don't enjoy it, but you can understand how things like that happen, but not with little children. When I look at this cross, I also see religious blindness. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14 says, Let them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Nothing will ever darken your mind any more than religion. Religion is the enemy of God always has been. Religion was born and bred in the pit of hell. We have it. We have, we have it. We have. Uh, 
computers. I use a computer, have for a long time. And that computer, you can feed all kinds of information into it. Program it, as they say. There's a lot of different programming languages for computers. Computers do a lot of good work, no question about it. It's like the internet, for example. There's a lot of good on the internet, then there's a lot of hell on the internet. It depends on what you're looking for. So when I look at this religious blindness, this is what I'm trying to say to you today. A blind religious heart is one that has been, it has been programmed to accept certain things and then there are red flags that pop up and if one of them pop up, you immediately turn off what you're listening to. That's religion. Instead of allowing your mind, God gave you a mind, use it. He gave you a brain, think. I want you to think about something today. Have you ever really asked yourself this question? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? What's life about? What's the purpose in all of this? Where did I come from? Do you know where you came from? I'm a spirit being. Do you tell me what a spirit is? You were born, you say, such and such. And yeah, but what happened before you were born? There was that moment of conception in the mother's womb. Something goes on. You can't explain it. You've got a reason for living. God gave you, he gave you life. He put you here. Have you ever wondered about this? Have you ever wondered about creation? Have you ever wondered, have you ever really studied a human body? Just a human body. The, the, the procreation, the recreation, the bearing of children. On the surface of it, I'll know a little about it. I've done some digging into it. And the deeper I dig, the more I marvel at the hand of a creator that made us the way he made us. It's quite a thing, folks. I don't see how in the world any doctor could be an atheist, a fool. An MD, a doctor, if he knows your body, if he doesn't believe in God, you're a fool, house. You're a fool. There is no way that that body could come into being. His intricacy is death, as, as wonderfully made as David said. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. DNA, look at this. You really believe that this just happened? Where did this code come from? It came from God. Don't you want to know more? Don't you want to get outside your religion and ask, get on your face and say, God, show me. Teach me. Give me a mind that's willing to learn and understand. You realize I'm 76 years old. I'm 76. And do you know something, folks? I'm like a little child in a lot of things because God is opening stuff up to my mind. You know why? Because I want to learn. I want to hear him. Speak to me. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And he marvel at the stuff he begins to show you. You want to learn? You want to know? Or have you closed your mind to your religion? If it doesn't fit in your religion, then you turn it off. And that's the way an awful lot of people are. Well, you're assaulting my religion. I don't have any use for your religion or my religion. It's about Christ. Don't care anything about religion. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. If a Presbyterian can get close to Christ or a Methodist can get close to Christ, Baptist get close to Christ, whatever, I respect that. But I couldn't care less about his religion. It's Christ and him crucified. And then the third thing I see when I look at this cross is satanic intervention. The Bible said in John 13 verse 27, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now, who are we talking about here? We're talking about Judas Iscariot. One of the twelve sat with him, ate with him. And the Bible says he was given the power to cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. He was an apostle, full-blown apostle of the Lamb. One of the twelve. And my friend, he turned on him. And why did he turn on him? He turned on him because he had things inside his soul. He could never bear to God. He could never get it right. And he was ripe for Satan to enter into him. And Satan did enter into him. Here just raises the greater question than that. And that is this. Satan only knows so much. If he had really known the scripture and known the prophecy of the coming of the Son of Man, and known who he was messing with, he would never have sent him to the cross. Because it was at the cross that he sealed his doom. It was at the cross the Lord Jesus Christ made a show of Satan openly. It was at that cross that he stripped him of his power. Because Satan brought everything he had against him. And the Lord Jesus Christ opened it all up and showed it to the demonic world. 
Now you've used everything you got. You got nothing left. And that's what happened to the devil. But the Bible says he entered into Judas, satanic intervention. And then there's mob justice. When I look at the cross of Christ, I see mob justice. Mark chapter 15, verse 13, and they cried out again, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, why, what evil hath he done? They cried out the more exceedingly, crucify him. Why crucify him? What do you mean crucify him? This is mob justice. You live in an age, most of you young people growing up, you've never seen a pack of dogs running the streets. I grew up when dogs ran in packs. If a female went into heat, you'd see 5, 10, 15, 20 dogs following her. They'd be fighting over her. Where I lived one time, the dogs ran out into the street trying to get to the female and car ran over two or three of them. And you can hear them yelping in the street and crying out. That's the world I grew up in. But have you ever seen a pack of dogs turn on a dog? One dog, a pack turns on it and they rip it to pieces and screams and dies right there in front of you. See, a lot of you have never seen anything like that. But that's the world I grew up in. You see, that's mob justice. There's a mob mentality. There's a pack mentality. Like a pack of wolves. Wolves hunt in packs. The mobs. Have you ever thought about a low information, knee-jerk mob? They'll be going to the polls in a couple of days. Low information, knee-jerk mobs. They'll be going out to the polls. They'll be voting their emotions. They'll be voting their party. And they know they don't have a clue what they're voting for. Right. America's headed my friend down just like that. And the only thing that'll ever stop it's Almighty God. You ever heard of a man named Elon Musk? You ever heard of Elon Musk? He bought Twitter. He's not a Christian. Well, say, preacher said, God can't be in. Are you kidding? He used Cyrus. Called him his anointed. Put his name in the book of Isaiah 700 years before Christ. 150 years before Cyrus was ever born. His name was in the Bible. And they showed it to him. Blew his mind. That's me, he said. Yes, that's you. He couldn't. <laughs> something greater than him. So you mean to tell me that God can use Elon Musk? Sure he can use him. <laughs> you kidding? Isn't it amazing that a, that a pagan like him has more appreciation for the freedom of speech than two-thirds of the people who are brainwashed in these religious institutions in this country? Amen. You're religious. You sing songs. You pray. But you're not worth a dime. Well, you're making me mad, preacher. No, I'm trying to get all true to you. Amen. I'm trying to wake you up today. Whether you know it or not, your country's going this way. Yes, you need to understand that. This is the mob mentality. Most folks are go along to get along. Don't go against the flow. You gotta keep this, keep that, so forth and so on. So I go along to get along. I don't say anything. I don't rock the boat. Yeah, but you're going down with it. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. This is mob justice. Mob justice. Now Pontius Pilate was a Roman. And he was no doubt, uh, he was no doubt a veteran of wars. And Pontius Pilate brought the man out in John chapter number 19, verse number 5, and said, Then came Jesus wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. That term in Latin is echo homo. And it means this, look good at him. I've ripped his back open. I've rammed a crown of thorns down on his face. Blood's all over his eyes. Can't see. Blood's dripping off of his beard. His back in shreds. Beaten to a pulp. Isn't that enough for you? That's what that means. See, that's, that's what you call a rhetorical thing. Here it is. Isn't this enough blood? Behold the man. Look at him. Surely that will satisfy your bloodlust. Now what did it say? No, 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 no. They cried out the more exceedingly. Crucify him. We want to see him die. We want to, we want to crucify him. You see the Lord Jesus Christ forgives and he cleanses white as snow. And some of you in here today should have been crucified and so should I. But I got forgiveness and redemption. 
through the blood of Christ. Aren't you glad for that? I'm so glad for one that is so far above us, above us. He doesn't think like we think. He doesn't act like we act. He's not one of us. He's above us, beyond us. He's untouchable, but by the Holy Spirit of God. So, then when I look at the cross, I see man's fallen nature. What's that? The Bible said, sitting down, they watched him there. <laughs> Can you imagine? You like to go to a ball game? Fine, go to ball games. You like to go fish? You like to hunt? You like this? You like race and this and that? It's all fine. Would you like to sit down and watch somebody suffering on a cross? You like to watch that? Is that does that get your attention? They watched him there. They really, they really fixed themselves upon it. Rome, 2,000 years ago, they had the pontificate. They had the Pontifus Maximus. They had the Cardinal Maximus. They had the, they had the Pontifus Maximus had declared himself to be a god. He had his Vestal Virgins. And the Vestal Virgins had what's called the Sacred Fire. And the fire was to Vesta, their god, their goddess. She was a goddess. And these Vestal Virgins had great privileges among the people. They could come and go. I'm thinking about only something like eight or nine or ten of them at one time. And they were, they, they were literally almost to the point of worshipped. But if they ever broke their vow, if they ever broke that vow, they would dig a hole, put a ladder, and put her down in that hole. And then they'd cover it with dirt. And she would die in a place where she couldn't eat. She starved to death. She was put into a living hell. That's what they did to Vestal Virgin. When they came to this country, up there in Massachusetts, they went after a witch hunt. They took an older lady, her name was Rebecca Nurse. Look it up, Rebecca Nurse. She was a fine woman, no question about it, good woman. But they accused her of witchcraft. So they took her, tied a rope around her neck, threw it across a limb or some kind of a thing, a scaffold. And they hung her until she died. We don't hang people. We're not hanging anybody. There's, there's no firing squads in here. What are they hanging people for? Let me tell you what happened to these people. They were so ignorant, so ignorant of the kingdom of God that they thought when the Old Testament says, suffer not a witch to live, that meant for them to suffer not a witch to live. They couldn't make a difference between the grace of God. The Bible said the law was given by Moses. But what does it say then? Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's what it says. The law by Moses. Under the law, man picked up a stick on the Sabbath day. He just wanted to pick up a stick, wanted to cook some food for his family, feed his children. <laughs> what did they do to him? They stoned him to death. They had no mercy under that. My goodness gracious. What a thing. But now, now, you take a bunch like that up there. I don't care how dedicated they are to what they believe. This Salem witch trial. I went to Salem, Massachusetts. I mean the kind of person I am. I stuck my nose around, you know, looked around, felt around. There's a spirit in there. It's still there, boy. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. Man's fallen nature. Let me tell you something about fallen nature. I'll move on. You hear a preacher that gets hung up on one thing all the time. I'll tell you what he's doing. He's preaching against the very thing that's working on him. That's what you got. That's what you got. He's preaching against what's eating him alive. And he's trying to justify himself by coming out before God and making this statement. Preachers fall all the time. I listened to preachers say this. He was talking about, he was talking about a murderer. He said, this murderer, he said, I'll be in hell. He, he ought to be in hell. He's a murderer. But the very man that was preaching that was running around chasing whores all over town. The very preacher that was preaching about that you say, what, what do you mean, preacher? I'm telling you this. You'd be surprised at how many people right now do what they're doing and justify themselves by all the wives that Solomon had or David had. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. If Solomon made it to heaven and they, why, surely, 
A little, a little affair is not going to hurt anything. Y'all too quiet in here this morning. God bless your soul. You're worrying me. <laughs> yeah. You want to kill a church, you got a bunch of fornicating going on in there, and you're dead, folks. Amen. 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 Folks, don't try to justify it. It's wrong. Get right with God. Get on your face. Ask God to forgive you, cleanse you of the blood of Christ, and get back where you need to be. But it goes on all the time. It's still going on right now. It's still going on. The Bible says this, though. When I look at that cross, I see this. Love. That's what some of you are looking for. You are. You're wondering if that man you're married to loves you. Or you wonder if that woman you're married to loves you. You are. You're looking for it. You would never say it publicly. Or you'd never say it to them. But you're looking for love. You see, if you never get love, if you never have any love in your life, you've missed the greatest thing there is on this earth. And my friend, the love of God is the greatest of all the loves. The Bible said in Matthew 27, 36, and sitting down, or Romans 8, 37, they and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. Ephesians 2, 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love. As Christ hath loved us and given himself for an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Then in 2 Thessalonians, the scripture says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father which hath loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope. Then 1 John 4, 10, here in his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Amen. Folks, love's not a weak word. It's a strong word. Amen. You men, if you really know what love is, you'll give your life for your family. Amen. You'll stop the aggressor. You'll meet him face to face. Amen. If he breaks into your home, you'll meet him before he gets to your wife and children. Amen. 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 If you know what love is about, you will go to work when you don't feel like going to work because the bills have to be paid. You'll take care of those little children that are depending and trusting on you. Those little children are vulnerable. Children are vulnerable. And I'm going to tell you something else. There's nobody on this earth that understands love any better than a child. Little children know God gave them that because they need that. Because they're so vulnerable. Little children need somebody to love them. That's one of the greatest things on this earth is love. You ever found love? You ever had love? Somebody ever loved you? You ever loved somebody? The biggest portion of people out here in this world, the only thing they love is themselves. I'm going to tell you something. Now, I'm not going to tell you to try it, but I'll tell you something. If you are so big into self-love, I'll tell you what let's do. You tell your wife that you know what it's going to take to heal your marriage and take care of all your problems and everything. You tell your wife that and say, I'm going to start loving myself. Husband, tell your wife you're going to start loving yourself. Get you all the books on self-love. Get to find out all the evangelists out here preaching self-love. And just load yourself up with it. And I mean just get to the point where you are madly in love with yourself. <laughs> and see how your wife reacts. Amen. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> you say, well, I'll be a fool to do that. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. And so are these evangelists that are out here preaching this garbage to people. Amen. Now your problem's not self. Problem is that you, your problem is not that you need more self-love. Your problem is you need to love the Lord. And if you really get the love of God in your heart, you'll love your family. And then the Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. And the scripture says in Revelation 1, 5 from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And here's the last thing I see when I look at that cross. I see the wisdom of God. Yeah, the wisdom of God. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, but unto him, unto them rather, which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. 
It's the wisdom of God and who he is. It's the wisdom of God and when he came. It's the wisdom of God and what he did. It's the wisdom of God is where he is. It's the wisdom of God that he comes again. It is the wisdom of God that God has already laid down before the foundation of the world. And this is the part you need to get your mind into. Before Adam ever sinned, God did not react to Adam. He knew all along what was going to happen. And he used it. Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. John 17, Father, I will they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. See this? What's going on here? Before the foundation of the world, Father, he called him. He wasn't incarnate until 2,000 years ago, but he's always existed. First Peter chapter number one, but with the precious blood of Christ, of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Foreordained for what? As the precious blood of Christ being shed by the lamb of God. And this is true, Right? Well, then what's the blood shed for? Sin. Well, then God knew about the sin before the foundation of the world. Yes. Absolutely. But it begins to show the wisdom of God. This is the issue. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Do you think you can outsmart God? How many believe they can? Good. At least we got some sane people in here this morning. Amen. <laughs> now, how many think God's smarter than you? Amen. All right. Good. <laughs> Good. You don't even talk about him being smart. He's absolute, infinite wisdom. There is no measurement to what he knows. What scale would you measure him by? What comparison would you give to this almighty creature, creator? What would you do? You can't. There's no way you can. But look at this. Matthew 13. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. See this? Things that are going to be revealed when the blood of Christ is shed for the sins of mankind have already been established before the foundation of the world. That's pretty good. Matthew 25, then shall the king say to them on his right hand, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. See the kingdom, see the dispensations of time, see the progression of revelation, all of it before the world was ever made. Who saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And then finally, Hebrews 4, 3. And there are more. Oh, yeah. There are more. This is only a few. Uh, Hebrews 4, 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, rest although the works <laughs> were finished from the foundation of the world. Yes, so what does that mean? That means God has a purpose. There's a reason for the, cre the existence of creation, yes, the creature. There's a reason for it. He's going to change it. Amen. The apostle Peter said the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. He said, therefore, we look for a new heavens and a new earth. We're in dwelleth righteousness. John said in the book of Revelation, he said, behold, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. That's what he mean, preacher. A new creation, a new purpose, something new that we're not ready for yet. What do you mean, preacher? We haven't got it all figured out. All we know is the redemption part. See, that's just part of it. Redemption, salvation, born again. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. That's the beginning with us. We're creatures. We're mankind. But God Almighty that made all of this, folks, do you think he's limited? No. The Bible said of the increase of his kingdom, there is no end. So what does all that mean? That means that I want to watch. I'm going to be there, buddy, and I'm going to be looking on these new worlds pop into existence. And I'll be like the angels that shouted and sang the glory of God when he brought the earth into existence. The morning stars sang together. Have you really thought about that? A new heavens and a new earth. 
This all stuff will all be gone. All of man's achievements, all of his cities, all of his ability, all of it, every bit of it, all of his, every bit of it. It's all going to go melt with fervent heat. And then he'll have that which has righteousness. God holds value in one soul that is born again and covered by the righteousness of Christ. And he does however many tons of gold there may be out there. There may be tons left and been discovered. Who knows? But that's nothing compared to the righteousness. Father, I pray. Maybe I said a little something in this house this morning. And some of it probably point blank to some people. Might have been a little shocking for them. For them to understand that the church of the living God... It's not some little song-singing religious place out here on the side of the road somewhere. But it is your body in this earth. It's made up of those who are born-again believers. I pray you'd use it this morning. Wake us up, Lord. We need to be wakened. We need to wake up. Heads bowed. If nobody's looking. I want to try to help somebody if I can. Would anybody raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, what you said this morning spoke to me. Because I agree, you told the truth. You told the truth. And uh, pray that God will open my eyes that I might be able to hold, behold more of the truth. Because that's a, that's a doctrine all through the Bible. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hands going up everywhere. I pray that prayer every day, folks. Every day of my life, I say, Lord, open my eyes. Open my heart that I might behold the wondrous things that you want to do in my life and what you're doing before me. I pray for God to open my soul. Anybody else would raise your hands this morning and say, now, preacher, God bless you. God bless you. Open mine eyes, Lord. Open mine eyes. Open my heart that I might receive and understand. Lord, I'm guilty of depending upon my intellect and my savvy and my skill and my experience and and look where it's got me. Anybody confess to that today? Well, I've had to do it. I've had to do it. You just drift into it. Well, how many of you raise your hand and say, Preacher, I want the Lord to open me up. I want God to begin to speak to my soul. I want to hear Him. I want to hear from God. Amen. Well, God bless you. God bless every one of you. Amen. Amen. You know I'm just the messenger, don't you? That's what I am. I'm the messenger. I have no power to bring about anything I said, but he does. He does. If you receive his word today, you have received the very power of God. The power of God's inseparable from his word. You've received it. Father, bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up.